Australia has a problem. Feral cats. They have become so abundant that there are calls for cults. But it's not the cat's fault they adapted so well to Australia. They have changed so much in both physical and behavioral characteristics from their domestic counterparts that we asked the question, could the Australian feral cat become a distinct species? Australia has all manner of weird and wonderful wildlife, but the government has recently waged war on one of its species, the feral cat. These cats are not native to the continent and were brought to the country centuries ago. They arrived on ships sailed by European colonists back in the 1700s, possibly earlier, and they made their way into the Australian outback. They were released into a land that was entirely unfamiliar to them, parts of which are some of the most inhospitable on Earth, and yet they survived. Since then, they have driven 27 native animals to extinction, and they threaten 124 more. Every year, these feral cats kill 1.1 billion mammals in Australia. They are considered one of the most dangerous pests the country has known, and now new and inventive ways of catching and disposing of them are being implemented. Despite years of trying to eradicate these pests using cutting-edge technology to detect and capture them without harming any non-target wildlife, it feels like it's a losing battle. The cats are thriving in Australia. The conditions are perfect for them. There are a multitude of habitats in which they can live. They have a huge supply of mammals they can hunt, putting species like the greater bilby, numbat, and gilbert's potteroo at risk of extinction. But could their success be down to something else? Could they be genetically different from domestic cats? Originally, they were ordinary house cats brought over from Europe. They weren't any different from your regular pet tabby. But they have now been in Australia for so long and are thriving so much that the government has taken action. Could they be evolving into a new species entirely? Could Australia one day add the feral cat to their list of so-called native wildlife? Perhaps Felis australis? The dingo is a classic example of establishing itself in foreign lands. Initially brought over by Asian seafarers around 4,000 years ago, the dingo was native to East Asia. But now that their population has spread through the Australian mainland, they are synonymous with Australia, and many foreigners could be forgiven for thinking that these wild dogs had always been there. And that's not all. There is a fierce debate about whether the dingo is even a dog. It seems to be an intermediary between wolves and domestic dogs. But it has evolved due to Australia's environment and is now quite different from the Asian dog it came from. But one thing has been made clear. The dingo is not recognized scientifically as a subspecies of dog or wolf, and not a unique species in its own right. But what about the cats? The damage Australia's feral cats are causing is concerning. They have changed over the years they have been on Australian soil. Those captured weigh up to an impressive 15 kilograms, 33 pounds. They are now double the nose-to-tail length of domestic cats, they are large enough to take down wallabies and even koalas. They inhabit places where dingoes and foxes haven't spread, becoming the apex predator in that area. But why have they become so large when feral cats in other parts of the world haven't? The answer lies within the niche available to them. The cats in Australia have taken advantage of the prey species on offer. They haven't been limited to small rodents and birds like feral cats in other parts of the world. They can access medium-large-sized marsupials like wallabies, possums, and small kangaroos. These provide the feral cats with nutrient-rich prey. Furthermore, there aren't any large land predators in Australia, so there isn't a selective pressure for the cats to remain small and hidden from potential danger. The feral cats haven't just evolved their physical characteristics, they have also evolved their behavior to suit the environment. So, could these cats become their own species? Perhaps. The evolution of feral cats has been documented elsewhere. The Madagascar forest cat is descended from feral cats, and after thousands of years, they have become part of the landscape on the island nation of Madagascar. They are not considered a unique species, but just like in Australia, they are significantly larger than the domestic cats with their own unique fur patterns. They came to the island from trade ships, their descendants were from the Arabian Sea region. Today, they are large enough to pose a threat to Madagascar's endangered lemurs. 
So, although they have different physical and behavioral attributes compared to domestic cats, they are still domestic cats. The same can't be said for the Corsican wild cat, however. This cat was likely introduced to the French island of Corsica by the Romans. There has been debate over the years about whether this cat is in fact its own species. In 2023, Genetic analysis found them to be distinctly different from both the European wildcat and the domestic cat, so it seems that they have evolved into their own species. At the moment, just like the dingoes, the Australian feral cat breeds with their domesticated counterparts. Typically, these are farm cats that live in more rural locations. But if the feral cats become so large that this breeding stopped and they began to see the domestic cats as prey and not mates, then the smaller genes from the domestic cats would be whittled out of the gene pool, and the cats would only grow larger still. There are many definitions of distinct species. Most common is the inability to interbreed with the other animal. Genetically, it is generally accepted that organisms need to have at least a 2% difference in their DNA for them to be considered separate species. Everyone thinks that evolution is an incredibly slow process, and, in some respects, it is. But with every single generation, there are new combinations of genes and mutations that may or may not improve the genetic fitness or survival capabilities of an individual animal. A larger cat means it can eat larger prey, fend off larger predators, and maintain a larger territory. So with each new generation, there comes the possibility of an animal surviving better in the environment and therefore passing its genes onto the next generation. There are many examples of animal species that have evolved in several years or less, rather than the thousands of years that Darwin once suggested. One example includes the green annelly lizards in Florida, which developed larger toe pads and more scales, allowing them to cling to higher branches to avoid competition with the invading brown annelly lizards. This transformation happened in just 15 years, or around 20 generations. Another example of rapid evolution includes an experiment with guppies that researcher David Resnick set up in 1981. He added predatory cichlid fish to a guppy site in a stream that was previously predator-free. In just four years, or six to eight guppy generations, the guppies had evolved in response to the presence of predators. They became smaller matured earlier and produced more babies. Now with the changing climate, we are seeing more animals adapting to the changing conditions. Salmon are migrating from the sea to the rivers earlier. This isn't just a behavioral change, it is a genetic one. The pressures of climate change are selecting fish that migrate a couple of weeks earlier. Less snow during Finland's winters has caused their tawny owls to change their plumage to more brown colors rather than white to blend in with the snowless background. In the case of the feral cats in Australia, it also looks like the evolution is happening right before our eyes. We can physically see that the cats are bigger than the domesticated cats. This has only taken a few hundred years. Where will the Australian feral cat be in the next few hundred years? Yes, these cats may not belong in Australia, and they join the list of other invasive species, like the dingo, camel, and cane toad. But given enough time, they could be seen as part of the Australian wildlife. Unless, of course, the government eradicates them first. In the heart of North America, a new predator is quietly carving out its place in the wild, and even in our backyards. The koi wolf, a fascinating hybrid of coyote, wolf, and domestic dog, is emerging as a contender for dominance in ecosystems across the continent. As traditional predators like wolves and cougars face ongoing challenges, koi wolves are thriving, expanding their range into both rural and urban areas. And what sets them apart, and could they truly rise to become North America's next major predator? The koi wolf story begins with human disruption of the natural world. As European settlers expanded across North America, they fragmented the wilderness driving wolf populations to the brink of extinction in many areas. Coyotes, which were traditionally confined to the western US, began to spread eastward in response to this ecological upheaval. In the early 20th century, in the forests of northeastern North America, these two species encountered each other and began to interbreed. 
Adding to the mix, domestic dogs also contributed genes, further diversifying the genetic pool. This process of hybridization created the koi wolf, an animal with a genetic makeup that is roughly 60% coyote, 25% wolf, and 15% domestic dog. While hybrids in nature often face disadvantages, the koi wolf is a striking exception. Through a phenomenon called hybrid vigor, this new predator inherited some of the best traits from each of its ancestors. From the coyote, it gained adaptability and a resourceful nature. From the wolf, it inherited strength, pack behavior, and hunting efficiency. Finally, the domestic dog's contribution added a degree of boldness and flexibility, enabling koi wolves to thrive in environments that might challenge their purebred relatives. This evolutionary process isn't merely a historical footnote. It's ongoing. As koi wolves continue to interbreed with coyotes, wolves, and dogs, their population remains genetically dynamic, adapting to the pressures of their environment in real time. Koi wolves are larger and more robust than coyotes, but smaller and more agile than wolves, making them a unique presence in the North American predator lineup. They typically weigh between 20 and 50 pounds, with some individuals exceeding this range. Their appearance is striking, with long legs, a bushy tail, and a strong, muscular build. What truly sets koi wolves apart is their behavior. Unlike solitary coyotes, koi wolves often form small packs, allowing them to hunt larger prey such as deer. This social structure is more reminiscent of wolves, giving them a tactical advantage in the wild. However, koi wolves retain the cunning and opportunism of their coyote ancestors, enabling them to exploit a wide range of food sources. Their diet is highly varied, reflecting their adaptability. In rural areas, they prey on deer, rabbits, and ground-nesting birds. In suburban and urban settings, they shift to smaller mammals, such as squirrels and rodents, and even scavenge for human food scraps. The dietary flexibility is one of the keys to their success in environments where other predators might struggle. Their vocalizations also hint at their hybrid nature. Koi wolves are known for their eerie howls, which combine the high-pitched yips of coyotes with the deep, resonant howls of wolves. This vocal adaptability helps them communicate effectively within their packs and maintain territorial boundaries. Koi wolves are masters of adaptation, a trait that has allowed them to expand their range rapidly across North America. While wolves are often restricted to large, undisturbed territories, and coyotes tend to avoid densely populated areas, koi wolves have managed to thrive in both wild and urban landscapes. In cities like Toronto, New York, and Boston, koi wolves have learned to navigate highways, use parks and green spaces as corridors, and exploit human-altered environments for food. They are primarily nocturnal, reducing the risk of encounters with people. In many cases, urban residents are unaware of the koi wolves living in their midst until the sightings or news stories bring them to light. Their ability to exploit human environments doesn't mean they've lost their wild instincts. In rural and wilderness areas, koi wolves display the hunting prowess of wolves, preying on deer and other large animals. To determine whether koi wolves could rise to the level of a major predator, we need to consider their ecological role. In many parts of their range, koi wolves are already acting as apex predators, particularly in areas where wolves and cougars have been extirpated. By preying on deer, rodents, and other species, koi wolves help regulate prey populations, preventing overgrazing and maintaining ecosystem balance. Their physical traits and social behaviors also position them as effective predators. Their pack hunting tendencies enable them to take down prey that would be challenging for a lone coyote. At the same time, their smaller size and greater agility compared to wolves make them better suited to environments with fragmented habitats, such as suburban and urban areas. However, koi wolves face limitations. They are not as large or powerful as wolves, which may restrict their ability to hunt very large prey, such as moose. Additionally, their reliance on urban and suburban environments could constrain their ability to expand into more remote wilderness areas where traditional apex predators thrive. Despite their adaptability, koi wolves face numerous challenges. Human activity remains a significant threat, 
from habitat destruction to roadkill. In urban areas where koi wolves often rely on scavenging, conflicts with humans can arise, particularly when they target pets or livestock. Negative encounters can lead to increased calls for culling or stricter wildlife management policies. Another potential threat is genetic dilution. As koi wolves continue to interbreed with coyotes, wolves and domestic dogs, their unique genetic makeup could become less distinct over time. This raises questions about their long-term evolutionary trajectory and whether they will remain a distinct hybrid or blend back into their parent species. Public perception is another critical factor. While some people view koi wolves as fascinating symbols of nature's adaptability, others see them as pests or threats. Shaping public attitudes toward koi wolves will play a major role in determining their future. Koi wolves are already making significant ecological contributions. By preying on overabundant species like deer, they help reduce overgrazing, which can have cascading benefits for ecosystems. Their presence also influences the behavior of smaller prey animals, creating a landscape of fear that can reshape ecosystems in positive ways. However, their rise also has potential drawbacks. Koi wolves may compete with native predators such as foxes, bobcats, and even smaller carnivores like raccoons, potentially displacing these species. This could disrupt existing food webs and alter the dynamics of local ecosystems. Additionally, their predation on smaller mammals and birds in urban areas raised concerns about potential impacts on biodiversity. Balancing their ecological benefits and drawbacks will require careful management and further research. What does the future hold for the koi wolf? As urbanization and climate change continue to reshape North America, the traits that make koi wolves successful today may become even more valuable. Their ability to adapt to fragmented habitats, exploit diverse food sources, and navigate human environments positions them as one of the continent's most resilient predators. In the long term, it's possible that koi wolves could evolve into a fully distinct species, further separating themselves from their coyote and wolf ancestors. However, this outcome will depend on how humans choose to manage their populations and habitats. Policies that promote coexistence, such as habitat preservation and public education, will be crucial in ensuring their survival. So, could the koi wolf become North America's next major predator? The evidence suggests they have the traits, adaptability and resilience to claim that title. They are already filling important ecological roles and expanding into new territories, proving their ability to thrive in a rapidly changing world. However, their future as a dominant predator will depend on their ability to navigate challenges, both ecological and human-made. What do you think? Are koi wolves the predators of the future, or will their hybrid nature limit potential? Let me know in the comments. That's all for today. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. You can also leave a comment with what you would like to see in the following videos. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.